Hey guys, Nick here. Just heads up, there's some mature language in this episode. Wanted to give you a fair warning. All right, let's get to it. Hey, welcome to Meyer Details. I'm Nick. And I'm Reed. And we are two industrial designers in the big city. Do I get to say yes. James's line? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sweating the small stuff. That's right. Um, super excited to have Reed in, filling in for James. Uh, Reed Schlegel is industrial designer at Aruladin um, and has been on several past podcasts. I literally have large shoes to fill today. It's hard. <laughs> James is size like 14 something, I think. You should ask him. Oh, you, oh yes, yeah. You're yeah. literally filling in for a shoe. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's those are big shoes. Yeah, um, and yeah, you gotta you gotta step up your uh, dad joke game today. Well, my girlfriend says I'm pretty good at them already, so we'll okay. see. Okay, okay, that's the, good. The moment has to strike properly, though. Um, but yeah, thanks for filling in. You know, James is on vacation, and he is skiing down the slopes of Colorado. That sounds wonderful. Yeah, um, but yeah, how you been, Reed? Things have been good. Um, been pretty busy with work which has been nice have some good projects going on and other than that i've kind of taken a back seat to sketching and things and i've kind of got minorly obsessed with legos recently which has been kind of fun just something i liked as a kid and i kind of went down this instagram rabbit hole of seeing all these people who do insanely beautiful things with them wait so are you saying that you follow a bunch of Lego builders on Instagram. There's there's communities for literally anything on Instagram. Oh, I believe it. Yeah, but you're into the Lego building community. Yeah, those people make it's insane what they can do, and there's whole forums on just different ways to put them together. So I'm almost thirty, and I'm getting back into Legos way harder than when I was ten. So I don't know. It's been an in- interesting uh, new revelation. Well, did you? I don't know if you listened to the podcast where we talked about the the trends um and how their trends are cycle through a 30 year cycle uh, i did hear that so maybe it's almost starting to be a lego trend again it's true at least for me it's a nostalgia thing yeah that's awesome are you so you built some legos recently i think i saw you posted something yeah i did this giant castle a while ago and then you during the viking s- ship recently right that's the one i'm finishing now okay you're finishing it <clears throat> but don't hold me to this anybody who's listening but my new thing is I've kind of gotten tired. I know there's been lots of discussion about sketching online and what it means for careers and everything. And I've always just kind of... Yeah, go back, listen to episode 46 on that. That's true. Yeah, guys, if you are a good person, you'll be caught up to date on their podcast. (laughs) Because I'm not saying this because I'm on it, but I actually do listen to them all. So, But there is an episode on that. And I've always seen Instagram as a place just to put stuff out there. And for me, whether it's a viking costume or building legos just a fun place to put stuff that keeps you creative i believe last time we talked you know we had our our mental mental awareness episode and you talked about your viking costume which was crazy um (laughs) and so you you're into the viking thing you're building this viking ship i saw you bought custom legos is that correct you can order parts oh yeah there's you, you can buy literally anything on the internet if you want to but there's a website called bricklink okay and you can go down that rabbit hole and buy any specific custom piece you want. And yeah, it's kind of fun. The Viking thing is more of just when I start something, I finish it. So it's more of I started this thing, so I'm going to finish it. But um, even that, I'm kind of like, okay, it's time for the new topic. I need something else. Wait, you're going to switch topics from Vikings? Well, what I want to do is I'm getting... The reason I started this whole rabbit hole of Instagram and sketching and everything and Legos is getting a little tired of doing the same tan paper sketching don't get me wrong i love it it's one of my favorite things to do but if you've noticed i do less of them but what i want to start doing is doing an architectural concept a month out of legos oh that's so cool. instead of rendering it or sketching it literally having to have all the pieces and make a physical really nice super like there's there's lego building right if you're the- watching youtube you see me doing air quotes and then there's like real lego building where like you go 10 times further and all these crazy techniques like the stuff people can do online just blows my mind and i spend way too much time searching all this crazy shit i yeah i mean i have i've not delved down into the lego (laughs) culture anytime recently um but yeah i I know that lego did release their architectures uh like 
Lego branded architecture. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you saw that or not. Yeah, they're really expensive, but they're, they're but nice. It's definitely marketed toward like people like us. Yeah. Um, no, that's awesome. So you just been you've been focusing on the Lego stuff, just kind of, you know, take it taking a taking a break from design after design, right? Yeah, I mean, I've I, mean always... I know you. I know you recently released a few products or announced a few projects that you worked on. At are you Are you leading? Mm-hmm. Um, I know the one was the backdrop paint set. Yeah, that was a really fun project. To be fair, I jumped in that project towards the end where I did the packaging experience. So the rest of my team at Are Leading did all of the brand identity, all of the website and the logo and everything. So that was a lot of the work that was done before I was on it. Uh, but it was a really fun project to be able to have a quick brief of what should this be, what should look like when it was out of the box, and then spending about a week and a half on it, and then all of a sudden having it shipped. Wait, so that project only took a week and a half for you? For me, the packaging right, right, right. Um, of actually designing, it was obviously months long because having things actually made and we had them right. get produced and everything, but actually concepting it, it was pretty quick. Um, but that project itself was a lot longer because the team was pretty big and it was very brand heavy and it was definitely several months to probably over a year at least at this point. Yeah, and this was a background, uh, background is a, I guess. Backdrop. Backdrop, sorry. Sorry, I got it. Got to get their name. <laughs> Backdrop, yes. Backdrop is a painting uh, startup doing, you know, just kind of revolutioni- revolutionizing the space, um, making everything nice design and and easy to use and stuff like that. Yeah. Because um, their cool thing is they have these really, really thin films that they someone actually hand paints on it. So then when you get it, you take that and stick it on your wall and it's so thin that it picks up every bump of the wall. So oh. instead of having to paint the little swatches and then you're like, crap, I don't like any of these, but now my wall's ruined. You can put them up, peel it down. You can put it in different parts of the room for different um, times a day for different lighting scenarios. And yeah, it's pretty fun. So like my mom is painting her house right now. And for Christmas, I got her a whole big, um, what's it called? Gift card for backdrop. So that's awesome. go out there and we're going to paint next week, which will be fun. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. Very cool. Um, I guess weekly updates on on my side. Uh, James and I are going to do a live podcast at Purdue uh, upcoming this, I guess, next weekend? Boilermakers. The, week, the weekend after? Uh, yeah, if you guys are in Purdue, I mean, it's for the Converge Conference. Um, and James and I will be there doing a little, little live pod and also some workshops. I think that's all the weekly updates I have. Um, but I know that you have an update. You were at the... Uh, you were a judge for the IDSA mm-hmm. Merit Awards. Yeah, so I'm pretty involved with Parsons School Design. And and you're currently an uh, adjunct teacher right there? Mm-hmm. Not okay. this semester. Okay. I've been doing it mostly in the fall, but there's been talk of doing it in the spring as well. Uh, but currently it's just the fall, and basically went out there and the head of the ID department asked me to be a judge. And the best part about it was when I got there, the two other judges were my old frog coworkers, so we actually all knew each other, which is kind of... The design world is very small, everyone. Don't burn any bridges. You will un- unintentionally run into people all the time that you used to work with. But this was a very positive one. Worked with um, Jonas Damon and Ina LaBelle, and they were judges with me. And we saw, I think it was seven students present their work. And we picked one. Now they're going to represent Parsons. So that was pretty fun. That's awesome. Are, are they... So I know there's been some changes. I think maybe this is kind of like design news per se, but um, apparently they you submit work now to the idsa you gotta like yeah this is this was told to me through that event but basically what i've heard is that someone please correct me if i'm wrong about this but the district conferences are no longer a thing for idsa okay and because of that when nick and i were students we had to present in front of a large group of people to actually win i didn't get selected well i mean even just when we had to do it at that point in time but um, did you did you win the idsa merit award i did yeah for the southern district um but Back then, I remember that being literally the scariest thing I ever did, having to get up in what felt like 500 people and present my work. Um, But when we did that, you had a single winner for each district, and that was it. And now, if I'm correct, it's supposed to be you have winners from each school for each district. They submit their work digitally. The judges pick it. And then once each winner from each district is picked, they actually go and have a winner for the country. But then they have to present in front of everybody. Uh, Okay, so I see they're kind of flip-flopping it a bit. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, it's a bummer, though, because, I mean, the district conferences were n- never as good as the international, but they were the best thing that we had as students. And I loved going to them as students. Because it was more accessible. Student. Yeah, and it was like the first time. It was, you, you need to build a network. You need to start small. You got to build a student network before you build a professional network, because I didn't know how to talk to 
professionals right. when I was 19. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like learning how to talk to other designers, start there and then go to the next one. But that being said, everybody go to the IDSA International Conference if you have the chance. Do one of the best gonna, things. Do you know where it's going to be this year? I don't remember. Is I, it? I have I have not been to one before. You should go if you okay. can. It's. I always make a joke when I speak at schools to say, have one less beer every weekend and use that money to go to the conference. It's probably, the math is definitely wrong, but it's definitely something that is worth doing if you can afford it. And I'm not trying to say it's cheap because it's, it's expensive. Yeah. But. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. Well, that's awesome that you were a judge. That's, that's cool to, cool to hear. Yeah. Fun time. Um, also another design news thing. I don't know if you visited or not, but uh, the new vessel in New York city just opened up recently and it's kind of like a hot, hot news on all the design blogs. Um, and the vessel is this, I guess I think of it as a beehive. It's like a giant beehive in New York city by the architecture firm, Thomas Heatherwick studio. Um, and you know, you, you guys can look it up online or we'll have it on their website to see, um, or James will put it in post on this video. <laughs> Sorry, James. <laughs> yeah. Everyone in my office was calling it the, um, What's the food you get where they slice the meat off and it's on a stick uh, and it goes around? A, uh, shawarma? Shawarma. They're Is it shawarma? It, they're calling it the shawarma. It, I saw a funny picture of a shawarma truck in front of the vessel. That's awesome. Like a food truck. And it had like the shawarma right next to the vessel. It was hilarious. Um, yeah, it actually got a, a bit of criticism online. I have not been. I've obviously walked by it plenty of times as it's been under construction for a long time. But um, yeah, this, this past week, and I believe it opened up. Um, yeah, it, you know, I think people were a little bit, I guess, uh, disappointed in the presentation. There's, what, like of the event? Yeah, well, so so some of the critique was kind of about the experience of visiting the vessel. My roommate went, and he said that he kind of like walked into this weird courtyard area, and then you saw the vessel. It was like a weird kind of yeah. like transition. Well, I mean, so... My girlfriend's urban planner, and I've been learning a lot through her about developers and everything. Okay. So I'm probably bastardizing this, but a big thing has about... She, has she mentioned the vessel to you? Not or? that one specifically, okay. but she's mentioned to me a lot about how public spaces work and how a lot of times to get the rights for building there, they also have to build a park. So for them, the park is like, ah, the government made us do that, so we got to put a park in. Oh, that's But this one is one where it looks like or it is a really, really well-known architect made it. So it's a little different than just putting in a regular park. And also this is me speculating from what I've heard. So I think this is probably accurate, but it is in a big courtyard of a bunch of expensive buildings for wealthy people, which is kind of a bummer. And it's also like weirdly on the West side of the city. So it's, but it's at the end of the High Line, which is kind of nice. So it's like a tourist like train. You go up the High Line or you go there, go down the High Line, you get off in what soap, but meat packing. Right. It's like it's perfect if you got a day in New York City. It's it's really interesting because you can climb up the stairs. It's like the the stairs go all the way to the top, but you know, it it looks like a beehive. So like at every single level, you can either choose to go left or right up the stairs. I don't know. We'll we'll post a picture of it. If you guys haven't checked it out, definitely check it out online. Um and I kind of want to visit it and at least at least mm-hmm. walk up at some time. Well, I mean, side note, Thomas Heatherwick is one of my like design crushes. Okay. I love his work or his studio's work because there's no such thing as a star architect or star industrial designer. Like people who work at that firm made it happen just as much as that person did. But right. The, the, the star architect just doodled it and then they had a bunch of interns. I would like this. to think he had a little more to do with it than that. But I love the fact that his work or his studio's work kind of blends industrial design and architecture, which is my ultimate goal in life is mm. to blend industrial design architecture and then teach on the side to kind of support it. Right. And I like how they do that. Yeah. I mean, you've always been sketching up those architecture pieces. Yeah. Oh, I, I, this is kind of a side note, but the uh, recent thing that you've been doing of posting other people's renderings mm-hmm. of your architecture sketches has been really cool. I got one for tomorrow or Monday. Okay. I got a, what's it called? Animation someone did. Okay. It was really fun. I did this concept of, uh, have you ever been camping? They have those outdoor kind of hut areas which are free and if you guys are oh, yeah. li- if you live near new york there's they, state park. i think it's just like shelters yeah. or like lean-tos depends mm-hmm. where you are but i did one that was concrete and had this big like lattice work that kind of scissors up and closes out of the way and this morning i woke up to a comment and someone had rendered it and or modeled it rendered it and then animated it yeah and it was awesome it was like some 19 year old student from i'm not even sure where they're from right but i messaged him and i said hey 
if I tag you, can I post it? Yeah. Because that's something everyone should do on Instagram. If you repost it, always make sure you tag the original person. Of course. So I want this person, their hard work, to give them credit for. But it it was pretty cool. Yeah. Because I don't know how to do that. I've never done it before. It's crazy how realistic that these people can render out, like, products or architecture. It's so insane. The scenery is the part that blows my mind. It's like, how do you do grass in there? It's like, yeah, I could do that. Yeah. But then, it's like... Wait, what? I mean, I mean, I will say like architecture students have a completely different like tool set of uh, rendering software that they use for all those, like the trees and everything. So, mm-hmm. I mean, I don't know. Is it V-Ray? I, they, they have all kinds of software that does all that fancy stuff. But it oh, looks, yeah. It looks oh, like, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh. It looks amazing. That's my James impression. <laughs> That's your James. I'm James. trying. Okay. <laughs> I need to, I need to like, I need to step it up. I can feel my energy is not high enough. Um. James's energy is pretty high. He always comes in here, and I, yeah, he's he's off the wall sometimes. James is a great, like a nice twinkle in my life. He keeps, he's a nice twinkle in my life too. Yeah. He's more, he's more like a a beacon of a star in my life. Honestly, James is like a twinkle that's down the street from me, which is great too. So yeah. like, hey, you want to get a beer? He's like, yeah, let's do yeah. that. If James wasn't in New York, I don't know, I'd probably be dead on the street. Honestly, man, I wouldn't have a job. I would like to think I, I wouldn't, wouldn't have be a podcast. Dead if James wasn't here. <laughs> But I would be sadder or less happy. I don't know. My grammar is not great right now. <laughs> um, but anyways, we wanted to talk about this this week. I thought this would be a great chance for us to talk about in-house design and consultancy design. And maybe even throw in freelance design as well. Um, you know, just having your perspective read and then my perspective. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and yeah, I guess, you know, there's... We've got a few emails about like which one, which one should I choose or which route should I go, um, but yeah, I don't know if you have any, I guess, just initial like mm-hmm. thoughts on pros and cons of consultancy. I mean, you've worked in consultancy only, only mm-hmm. forever. Yeah, I mean, I've been working professionally since 2012. So, what are the studios? Just name them right quick. So really, uh, in retail internships worked at a place called HS Design, which okay. is mostly medical work out in Gladstone, PPAC, New Jersey. And then I worked at Quirky, which wasn't really consulting. It was kind of like startup I'm not sure what that falls under. Okay. But per- uh, since I've been a full-time employee, I worked at Smart Design, Frog, and now R. Leiden. Okay. Um, and I have only worked at PetMade, which was in-house. Mm-hmm. Um, but can you speak to any of the like, I guess, pros and cons of working at these studios and maybe some maybe nuances of each of them. Yeah, it's funny. I mean, I feel like I've made a thesis in my mind of the difference between in-house and consulting when I've never actually done in-house. So I'm also curious to see if what I say is something you're like, what? No, that's wrong. But yeah, every consulting place is different, just like any in-house place. And something I want to start off with is there's no right or wrong answer. I don't think one is better or worse. They both have pros and cons, the same as anything in life. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they're all very different. Like when I was working at Smart Design, we did we had a huge shop um, that rivaled any school shop I had seen, like full plastic, then spray booth, um, metal, wood, plastic. They had, what's it called, silicone casting, and anything you could think of. And there was a huge resource of materials just to pick from. And they had shop techs doing all that work, right? Or did you actually get to go in there and carve up foam? Uh, It was both. So it's actually funny. I was talking to my friend Ron, who I called out on the first time I was on the podcast. He is this magical wizard of a man who just can build anything. So it's him and this guy named Taru, and they run the shop at Smart Design. And they're the ones who do really, really in-depth things. But then I would be in there building whatever I needed, and that was really fun, making prototypes and working on whatever we needed to do to basically engineer something or figure out if it was worth um, testing. Um, but that was one thing that was very different about Smart, whereas with the Frog, we had a shop, but it was pretty small. And then now at R. Leiden, we have a 3D printer and like a cutting mat. So it's like, it's very, it does, it, every studio is different. But then again, the types of projects are different. And honestly, I can talk about this for an hour. So maybe what do you want to know? What are some things that you would be curious about that's different or whatever's um, on your mind? Yeah, I think one of the, well, I mean, one of the things that you pointed out is that these these in house or these these consultancies have a range of shop mm-hmm. shop styles, which is interesting because when I graduated, I really wanted a shop. I like think I, everyone does. Yeah, I, I think everyone wants to like have a shop and then be able to go in to their work and like, oh, mm-hmm. hey, can I just stay late and work in the shop? Um, 
which is actually kind of a unique i there's a story that i when i graduated i interviewed at a couple places um and at petmate they did have a shop for say i mean they had like a bandsaw um a drill press and and some some tools to get the job done nothing like expansive not probably not as great as, as smarts shop um but i interviewed at this other company that had a huge shop, like mm-hmm. every tool you can think of, an entire like CNC, wooden CNC thing. And I was so excited. I was like, oh man, I, I want to work here because they have an amazing shop. Mm-hmm. And but, but the one thing that you have to ask, the one thing that is important, especially as you're looking for these jobs, is you got to ask the, the your boss, like, hey, is doing side projects in the shop, is that on the table? Like, mm-hmm. is that acceptable? And I think I, I asked that at this other company, and they said no. Like, we you're not allowed to do side projects in here. Yeah, I would have said no to that job just with that answer. Yeah, and and I did, and I went to Petmate because they were like, oh yeah, no no problem, come I in mean, the shop. Do as what long you as you're not using your work time or their materials or destroying yourself or right. anything in it, right? Why does it matter? Yeah, it it shouldn't matter. I don't know why they said no, but I mean, hey, um, to each his own. Yeah, to each his own. But yeah, I mean, I, I, I know we're kind of getting off topic with talking about shops and everything, but I think that's it's something... A, it's an aspect of, of where you work. I mean, a lot of people are interested in doing their side projects. But I mean, shops are not consulting or in-house. Both could have it. Yes. It's like, it's something that it's very much dependent on the company. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think the unfortunate thing is that shops are kind of becoming fewer and farther between. Like, people don't have them as much as they used to. Yeah, we just have 3D printers now. Yeah. But, and I don't know. I like... 3d printers and how easy they are to use now before i had to give it to the technician and he would make it work and all these things because they were like eighty thousand dollar machines but now we just have a maker bot in the office right. and just throw it on and it's done well at, at petman we did have the eighty thousand dollar machine actually i think it was a hundred thousand it was you know one of the stratasys like multi-jet fusion things whatever and uh yeah i remember that material itself was like five thousand dollars just for the resin and mm-hmm. I just remember like printing out parts because, because it was so like hands off at Pitmate. Like it was just like, Oh yeah, there's a printer back there. Like talk to the engineer, figure out how to use it, Nick. And then, you know, do what, do what you want. And I was like printing out like, like huge, like cat toys that were like $5,000 mm-hmm. prints, like all the time. And I was like, Hey boss, you know, I know that like there's probably a budget for this, but like I could save some <laughs> money if we just bought a 3D printer that's FDM. Yeah, but we yeah we eventually got an FDM printer. Uh, it's like have you seen the new Arrested Development season? Uh, I I'm not aware of the uh, the shows online. I forgot that you don't yeah. do television. Yeah, we. I, um, but there's a whole joke where they buy a, a printer to be to be like modern, yeah. and they get a dental printer, so they print everything on this 3D printer printer for dental parts. And that's what I'm imagining right now is like you need to print out one page, but then you make a $5,000 print instead of the page. Exactly. Yeah. That's how it felt for sure. Um, but yeah, what like, I guess, you know, we can talk a little about the pros and cons. I think generally, you know, the pros of consultancy is that you have a range of of products and clients that you work with which can be exciting to a lot of people Mm -hmm. like being able to like come in and every day is something new um compared to in-house where again you know it it there's a wide range of in-house jobs but you know like for me at petmate i was just doing dog toys a lot um and still that, that can be exciting maybe i do a cat toy one day but at the end of the day it's like still pet products Mm -hmm. um and you know it can get monotonous i don't know have you ever felt like you enjoyed the aspect of always working on something new it depends i mean i think when you work consulting for so long your skill becomes being okay with ambiguity and flexibility where i can i don't give a crap who the client is i can design something for you that's going to i would like to think be a good solution that's nice looking because you get a process and a big part of your process is just being open to whatever comes in and figuring it out. And it depends on what you like to do. I think people ask me all the time, like not all the time, but like if you could design anything, what would you design? And I have a hard time answering that because I've never really gotten to choose that for the last seven plus years, except for my free time, which is why I build 
Legos and Viking costumes and things that have nothing to do with actual my day job. And when you do those types of things, you just get really good at saying yes and pushing forward and figuring it out. So you don't have an answer? Because I'm kind of curious now. Like, what would you what would you design if you had if just I could like anything? If 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 I just gave you a million dollars right now and no. said, "Hey, you have to design something," what would you design? Um, and you you get to design it for the rest of your life or whatever you want to do. Uh, like set up your studio, do whatever you want. Crap, I don't know. I mean, I really like in my free time making one off things much more than making mass produced things. Interesting, because I have to think so much about reality when I'm at work that when I'm at home, I just want to design something that's just fun. So I know this is not at all like what you're probably expecting me to say, but I would love to just basically get uh, either like a 1943 original Willys Jeep or like a 1980s, 19 late 70s Bronco. And it's like from the ground up, build the coolest car ever. Would it be would it be really uh, tricked out or would it be like very authentic? Would you restore it to be very the Jeep authentic? The would what? be insanely authentic. Okay. I'm the person who reads the book and gets mad when the movie deviates at all. Okay. So I want it to be the same. <laughs> but the Bronco, that's where it's like, okay, I want to make this just my, I want to have my design vision on this car. That's okay. what I want. Interesting. Interesting. So, yeah. Well, you have $900,000 left over. <laughs> I don't just, know, I'm man. Those cars are expensive. <laughs> Uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I, yeah, I I've always sure. wanted to do outdoor gear. I've never done it. I think it'd be really fun. Ooh, like camping, like camping stuff. I, I, think I would really also fun. love to do camping gear as well. Um, but, but yeah, you, you're right. Like there, the consultancy thing, like if you enjoy that, that ambiguous, like, Hey, here's an idea. Can you just take it and run with it? Mm-hmm. I think that that's a pro for a lot of people. Um, you know, just having this like new and exciting thing all the time. Yeah. I know that's a pro for me. I've, I've always wanted to, I mean, I think that's maybe where this freelance thing comes in. It's, you know, freelance is like almost a wild card in this discussion. Cause it can really be a lot of things. You can be both. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean the freelance thing, I think I mentioned on the, on a past episode or maybe I have, but like, I've always enjoyed internships specifically because they were like three months of something new. Mm -hmm. And that can be like very similar to consultancy. Um, I think the one thing about consulting though, is that it has a burnout rate associated with it. I think it's because eventually it gets to you of having to do something new every single time. I'm not, that's interesting. I'm not at that point yet. I still got a good number of years left in me for consulting, but I know that I'm going to hit a point, especially probably when I have, a kid or something that is going to require a lot more of my attention. I would rather have a more consistent schedule, know what I'm responsible for Mm. and just a little clearer day to day. But like I said, still got more time until I want that, but it's on the horizon for me at some point. Yeah. I feel like that kind of rolls into the con of that, like the flip side of that, because, because you're right. Like doing something new isn't always, like it's a lot of fun for sure. And in a certain phase of your life, like it's exciting, but I think you're right. Like at a certain point, maybe you do want that, that control and that consistency of maybe even Mm in-house. Would you ever go in-house Reed? I would. I've actually, I mean, I've thought about it in the past. It's just the thing that scares me is I've never had to pick a topic and stick with it. So all of a sudden it's like, wait, I have to pick this and do it for years. I don't, I don't know even how to begin what you would pick. That's the thing. And, but what I like about, so one thing I love about my current company, our leading is that when we do consulting work, we'll do a lot of it. So it's not just make this cool product. It's what's the logo, what's the brand, what's the website, here's the product, here's the primary, the secondary packaging, and even getting into like the social media campaigns and everything mm, for that's it, cool. which is nice because usually when you're a consultant or not usually, but a lot of times when you're a consultant, you'll design this beautiful thing or set of things and then you'll pass it off and be like, I hope they don't fuck it up. Right. Ah, uh, like let's see how it comes out. Or you're going to have this beautiful thing and it's on a terrible website with a bunch of ugly products next to it. Yeah. And then the whole thing is diluted where our leading is the, firm that I've worked at that actually has the best consulting model that actually kind of mitigate that where we work clients, we kind of do the whole thing. But it, if you work in house, it's the opposite. Yeah. So, I mean, I, this is kind of something I I'm interested in because for me, especially as a freelancer now, you know, clients will come to me and say, Hey, I want this phone case designed. And I'm like, okay, sure. Like that's interesting. Um, but you know, the rest of your products and your entire brand and your entire website suck 
Mm-hmm. I could do an amazing iPhone case for you, but you know, you're going to put it up there on, on whatever your website is. And it's just going to like look really poorly. And yeah. you know, they have poor packaging and stuff. How does are you leading pitch the entire like rebrand or, or I guess like what is their client selection process like, or I don't even know if you're aware of this or not, but I think it it's depends on firm to firm where a lot of times firms usually get famous for something and people come to them for that. Mm. And then they'll either diversify or have secret skills and like, Hey, well, you came to us to redesign that cell phone case. Right. But you know, we also do X, Y, and Z. And in the like, um, huge, the, the pink one, not the blue one, they're like a digital company, but now they have I mean, last time I checked, like 15 industrial designers. I would have to fact check that. I'm not the New York times. I don't know exactly, but I know they have a lot and they started with people coming in for digital work and then they started building out their physical team. And then they were like, Oh, so now we can do your physical products too. And now they have a team that does both. So I think it depends on it's where it's like, what's it called? Frog was an ID firm originally. And now they've pushed much heavier into like design strategy type work. Right. And well, that's that, where that cash is. Yeah. Oh, oh my gosh. That's a whole other topic. Everyone wants to be a little McKinsey. If you can be McKinsey. <laughs> Wait, who's McKinsey? It's a big strategy firm. Okay. And, but if you can say the word strategy, it means add an extra like zero. dollar sign or two or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Zero. Um, that's interesting. Huh? I never thought about that way. Um, okay. What about here? Here's, here's an interesting thought. Uh, in terms of like the type of work you get to do, like the 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 actual deliverables mm-hmm. at consultancy, are you passing off CAD files or it, like surfaced? Like, are you working with samples and things like that? Or are you doing much more like visionary work or like sketches and things like that? I think all of the above. Okay. Um, right now, I'm working on a project which we're going to be getting complete looks like prototypes made so every morning get there you get your emails from taiwan and then you find out what needs to be changed what needs to be fixed and then you go back and forth um and then we work on projects that do full engineering we usually since we don't have in-house engineers we have a uh, external bunch of people we work with that we bring in for those but yeah it's everything from here's a vision project or here's a strategy project of verbally where you should be going to here's a vision project of renders where you should be going all the way to here are eight, here's a side CAD that you can take and you should work with your engineering firm, which we will also liaison with to get you some really, really nice actually produced objects. Yeah. I've always find that part of the equation a little bit, a little bit murky, especially on the consultancy side. Um, and, and as a freelancer, it's like, Hey, I can provide you with this, this, this design, you know, I can send you the 3d file and then you're just kind of like, I hope that you do the right thing with it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I feel like that is a pro of being in-house, especially at when I was at PetMate. Like it was like, hey, I, I'm the one like sending the 3D file to China. Like I am the one mm-hmm. getting the samples, reviewing the samples, being like, hey, this is incorrect. Let me tweak this little tiny detail that I want to be perfect. And then you know, producing this finished product that was my vision from inception all the way to the customer's hands, yep. which which is, I think, is a very strong pro. I mean, you think about Apple and their products. I mean, they, they have that nailed, you know, 100% down. Well, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> one of the things you always find when you're working consulting is it's not just designing the product, it's also designing the relationship with the client. Oh, that's interesting. Where you have to understand who your client is, what their expectations are, who works under them, who are the key decision makers. Your renderings can't just be, this is sexy because we think it's sexy. It has to be, this is sexy because the C-suite we're going to be in front of is going to be thinking about X, Y, and Z. And these things need to make sure that they are feeling happy about this. Yeah. So you always have to think about those things. And that's probably the same for in-house as well. But at least if you're in-house, you probably know those people and their expectations to a better degree. So you're kind of saving yourself that like ramping up period for a lot of new clients, which consultants have. Yeah. Um, and then I think another, another idea to think about as well, especially, you know, there's, there's, we have a lot of students that listen to this and people are 
maybe like targeting in-house companies or maybe they're targeting consultancy companies. I mean, my general advice is to target everything because it's a competitive field and, you know, it's really hard to get a job anywhere. Mm-hmm. Um, but what about in terms of the perks, benefits, pay? Oh, yeah. Do you have any thoughts on that? It's a good one. Like, I mean, that's a whole, that's, that's part of the, the equation, you know, like if you want to be in-house, there are, there are, I, I would say that the pay is a little bit better in-house. I think, I mean, I wouldn't know cause I've not done in-house, but I think you're right. I think it's the general rule. Like the theory I was talking about before is that the benefit of consulting is that you have lots of clients. So you learn a lot really quickly, not to say that if you go in-house, you're not also learning. It's just very different skill sets. Um, but at the end of the day, you probably have a little more erratic hours and you probably have longer hours and you probably get paid a little less if you're doing consulting. But then the other end of the spectrum, if you do in-house, you usually get paid more. You probably have more stable hours, but you need to be okay with the fact that you're probably going to have one or two things you're working on at once and you get a little more focused on it. And neither one is right or wrong. It's all about what you want. Sometimes I wish I could just sit down and get really good at a topic and just say, I am a master at ski poles. Some, I don't know, something random. I was just looking on your room and your lamp looked like ski poles. So I don't know. It's like I, don't, I, I get really good at it. And then I have to basically wipe my mind and go to something else. Or well, not wipe because you always keep those experiences and they influence everything. But... You need to be fresh every project. Do you like do you like the fact that you get a little bit of knowledge on each project? Yeah, that's kind of my favorite. That was my favorite thing about working at Frog. Was when I worked at Frog, industrial design was changing a lot. So a lot of the projects I did were pushing the boundaries of what you'd really call industrial design. So I worked on projects that were a lot of very strategy design research heavy. So those were things where I would do super in-depth month-long projects, like several month-long projects on things I'd never heard of before. Do you do you like the strategy aspect of consultancy? Because I, do. I because I feel like when you are I mean this this is another th- a thought being in-house, I feel like you get to do a little bit less strategy or you might it really depends on the company, but I think when you're an in-house designer, it's really hardcore industrial design in terms of like you are sketching, 3D modeling, mm-hmm. doing the grunt work, the just straight up, get it done, get it out the door. Whereas I think at consultancy, like I feel like you're doing a lot more presentations and, Mm -hmm. and like thought process around how these things should be presented and developed in the world. I I don't know. Maybe you can speak to that. Well, I think something I'd like to ask you is it seems like consulting firms have to always have very strong strategy to validate their work. Whereas when you're in-house, I feel like you have to have very, very strong marketing behind it. Like we have to get the strategy to win us over, but you guys and in, or when you were in-house have to get the marketing team one over. Like, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think maybe I, I would agree. Like there are certain people in in-house that you do have to convince of your of your design um and of course every every place is different but for me you know a lot of it was pretty pretty hands-off like it was delivered the design and you know maybe the marketing marketing team might had some concerns over costing and things like that or the the product the product managers might have some cost down ideas and stuff but Mm -hmm. in terms of like the the design itself the aesthetic direction and how it's interacted with, like it was all, all up to me. I think, um, that's cool. In, in terms of like the, the end marketing, like marketing to the consumer, we did have a marketing team, but it definitely, uh, specifically at pet made, it wasn't very fleshed out. Like, you know, like they had one person that just like ran, I guess some ads. I, I'm not really sure about that, that area mm-hmm. of like the actual company marketing. Cause, we sold to a lot of like buyers, yeah. which is another, which is another aspect of in-house. So, you know, if you work for a big corporation that sells consumer products to stores like Walmart, Target, all these, you know, big retailers, there are people at these retailers that select products for the stores and they're called buyers. And you, you know, as a company need to design objects so that the buyers will purchase those objects and put them in the stores, which throws a wrench in the entire design <laughs> process. Because, make it pink, make it green, right, make because, it bigger. Because the buyers aren't designers at all, but they are the, the decision maker 
and on whether or not these products will sell. And it, it's a little bit weird because, you know, as a designer, you're always striving to design the best product for the consumer. Mm-hmm. But then all of a sudden, there's this person that says, actually, you know, my daughter likes pink. Can we just make this product pink for her? And it's like very frustrating and very unprofessional a lot of times. And it's just, <laughs> it, really, it does get on your Those nerves. Those six months of design research, yeah, forget it. Yeah, don't worry. Yeah, your son likes blue. Yeah, we're gonna make it blue. It's done. See, I've never had to deal with buyers, yeah. but I've had to deal with marketing departments, mm. and I feel like that's as close as I'll get to understanding that. I, I think it is similar in, in some some ways. Um, but but yeah. yeah, ah, are we saying the same words? I think so. <laughs> it's interesting because I mean, I've always been curious when you were in house. Did you feel like it was actually easier to get your products through and pushed up because you had a clear vision? Or, like, as I was listening to your last episode with, was it Katie Lim? Yes. Okay, good. Um, and how she was talking about she had side projects that she pulled up, and those are ones that kind of made their way through. Right. But she had to kind of champion it. Like, how does that process work in-house? Like, how do you get new things going, or where does it all come from? That's a, that's a good question because, yeah, you're right. Uh, consultancy all the things come from your clients in-house. It's like, where do the ideas come from? Um, part of it does come from like the product managers or the marketing team or the, the people who are in charge of a brand, right? They're like, Hey, this is 2020. We have to develop X amount of SKUs for the target line or whatever it is. Um, and you know, they kind of kick it off and be like, Hey, you know, we need, or, or at least pet, pet made. It was like, Hey, we need, you know, a uh, fetch toy, a rope toy, mm-hmm. and a plush toy, you know, do some designs. And then we would des- design and develop them and eventually present concepts and things like that and, and move it forward through that. But yeah, I from, I guess, the the people that were initiating it was kind of the marketing team. You know, they kind of gave us these internal briefs um, to develop a line of products for the next year or whatever they need developed. Um and there was obviously some projects that were more, you know, maintenance projects. I remember like being working with the engineering team on like fixing, you know, injection molding tools that needed like tweaks and stuff to make the mm-hmm. product stronger, like running changes. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's a that's a good a good thought process to think about as well. What do you think about hours for consulting versus um, in house? Like day to day. My hours at PetMain, eight hours. Get there at eight a.m., leave at five p.m., or I get, and then I guess you have a lunch break. But like, it was rarely ever that I would stay late. I think I only stay late once or twice, but only on my own regard mm-hmm. because I wanted, I really wanted to make the design as best as I could. Yeah. Well, I think that question leads into another topic, which is basically time frames in which you have to complete <coughs> projects excuse me no problem um where oh yeah time frame for me i'm used to it's very heavy peaks and valleys of holy crap i have to get like a month's worth of stuff done in two weeks and yep. then okay nothing to do for a week and then uh, 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 and, and then also sometimes it's okay i have three projects that all are going at once and that's something what, that I feel like could be very different. What is the average number of products that you work on at Are You Leading? Or or maybe in the past, like what what do you think it is? Like is it three projects at a time or is it like 10 projects at a time? It's super, con- it's super dependent on the firm. When I was working at Smart, I probably had five things juggling at once. But some are in engineering, some are new, some are halfway through the project. Right. So it's all, it's not like it's a, it's here's a five variation. projects start tomorrow. Right. That would it's never a, happen because yeah. that would make you like, explode you yeah. couldn't finish that uh, but and the frog i only had one project at a time that was it oh, that's always interesting one that is really interesting and you you got a team room and you and your team would be in that room 10 hours a day for four months that's what you would do huh and then our lead in is a little it's kind of in between both of them i see where i'm working actively really heavily on one and then i have three or yeah, three on the back burner. One of those back burners is one 
thing. One is one thing and one is a whole line of products. So it's, I, I go more by product project, not product. Cause if you did product, it sounds like a lot more right, than it right, actually right. is. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Okay. I, I mean, from, from my side on the in-house at, at PetMate, we had, I would say I probably had around like five to seven things going at once. But again, kind of like you were saying, it wasn't all like, it wasn't like, all right, I have seven projects and all the concept sketches need to get done by Friday for all those seven projects. Mm-hmm. It was like one project is like, oh, hey, take a look at this and find a Pantone color for that. Or like, hey, take a look at this and like, you know, figure out the injection molding part of this mm-hmm. or, or things like that. It's but, kind um, of nice of that phase. You're you're putting out lots of small fires right. at once. Right. Yeah, I, I guess there's like a pro, to con, a pro and con of that because I feel like when you have multiple projects, you don't ever have a lull. But when you're on like a single project, you can have those those lulls. I, I feel like almost <clears throat> like honestly for me, I would prefer like the like oh crap, I got to get this done. I have to stay late. Mm-hmm. Then coming into work at eight a.m. and be like okay, let me just uh, get my coffee and I'll get and get it really slowly because I don't have anything to work on today. Yeah, that's mild torture. I'm not good at that. <laughs> yeah, I think it's also. I find some of the best work I do is when I have the insanely tight deadline. Yeah. I think James said something like that. A deadlines few podcasts deadlines ago. make the world go round. Like, you, you can only say this in hindsight because you want to die during it. Right. You're like, oh my God, so much to do so quickly. But when you are forced to go with your instinct, make a decision and do it, a lot of times it ends up probably 85 to 90% as good as you would if you had had an extra week. Yeah, it, it, it's the same. So... That's interesting. When you sit there and you have all this time, sometimes I will convince myself my good ideas are bad. That's that's a good point as well. Mm-hmm. Okay. Any any last thoughts, consultancy versus in house, Reed? Hmm. Probably. But we probably yeah, we we could probably talk about this for a long time. Yeah. If you guys have any thoughts, put it in the Discord. Um if you aren't familiar with the Discord, it's a chat room and it's been a great place for us to you know, interact with you guys. If you, if you have thoughts on in-house and consultancy, we want to hear it. Mm-hmm. Um, it's on our website and also the Instagram minor details, minor details pod. So check that out. And of course, every week we like to give some answers to our listeners that wrote in a email, or we also have a voicemail and our voicemail is a Google voicemail. So we won't answer if you call it but if you want to call us and leave a voicemail, it is 1-646-494-4011. And this week we have a voicemail from John of the Globe. Let's give it a listen. Oh, hang on. Let me, I guess I got to turn it on Instagram. Let me restart it. Oh, hang on. Technical difficulties. Give me a second. I can just make a question up if you want. <laughs> I have I have so many dating questions for you guys. I didn't realize this podcast became a dating thing recently. We did have a dating question the other week. I know. <laughs> like I said, I've heard all the podcasts. Um, yeah, we, we don't have any uh, uh, dating questions this week. Do you have any dating advice? Uh, no. Okay. Okay. I got it working out. You ready? Hey, guys. John from uh, John of the Globe on Instagram. Love the podcast. Uh, makes for a nice walk to work. So my question is really about qualitative research. It's something that I find fundamental to making good products. I'm interested what some of your processes might have been in the past and maybe how they've changed over time or, you know, what you do currently. I think it's just a good discussion point. Anyway, uh, keep making my morning commute a little bit easier. Thanks. Bye. I think it's a good question to answer from a consulting point of view and a uh, corporate point of view. That is good. Yeah. This is a perfect question for this episode. Yeah. How do, how do you guys do, how do you guys go about qualitative research in the consultancy side? I think just like everything else today, it's been firm to firm, very different. Like yeah. when I was working at smart, we would go, do a whole bunch of our own audits and research on our own. Basically like 
watching people in stores, seeing what's going on online, they'd make a bunch of prototypes based off of sketches we would make. And those, we would do lots of in-home research. So we would have things set up. I had my... Did, did you have to set all this stuff up or was there like someone that set it up for you and then was like, okay, Reed, you are, you're, we're flying you out to like X place and you get to go into this house and watch this person? Oh, it was fully collaborative. We had, we had full-time design researchers working with us the whole time. That is really nice. So when we would do that... We would all be, that's one thing I loved about working at SMART was that the person at the front desk, the person, anyone in any discipline literally was involved in brainstorming and everything. So when we had projects, it wasn't like, okay, do research, now give the research to the industrial designer and then give the industrial designer's work to the engineer. All of us were at the table from the beginning. So when we would do those things, we would come up with these prototypes and ideas and sketches, and then we'd go in the shop and I would make it, the shop guys would make it, whoever else in the project would work on it take those into houses and actually watch people use it, do whole observations for hours at a time. And that's how we'd really do it. But then when I worked at Frog, qualitative research was a little more strategy heavy where we wouldn't really do a lot of physical prototype testing for things. It was a lot more of, I worked on a project for this big app company and they sent us to Korea for two weeks and we did in-home interviews for four of them a day, hour and a half a piece, for like 10 days it was a marathon and a half and were you the one creating like the interview questions and and collecting the data like what was your role specifically as the industrial designer were you like i mean i assume you're asking the questions observing like what was your so what for frog at least actually for frog and smart and actually our leading too when we were creating it it was everyone was kind of Someone probably owned it a little bit, like the discussion guide, but everyone was able to put their feedback in. We would have reviews of the questions, figure out what we want to be asking. And then when it came time to actually doing it, the project I was talking about for Frog, we would literally rotate because it was a marathon. We were doing it for seven to 15 year olds. So they were, you had to really be paying attention to these things. And it was in Korean. So we had to have translators. Oh, that's, so we had, we had somebody, we had a, um, somebody giving the interview, somebody translating the interview, somebody from listening to the translator taking notes in the interview, and somebody else taking photos. So we had like a whole team, and every every one we'd all switch a spot. We'd all keep okay, rotating so, around. So you got the to whole do each, each little spot. Yeah, except, except for, for translating. Yeah, except for translating, asking. But, but other things, if it's in English, then everyone would actually just keep rotating around the whole time. Okay, that's kind of cool. What I like about how you? They, they split it up like that. I qualitative research and. Again, I'm sure that this varies heavily depending on the company that you work at. At, at PetMate, it was kind of just open. Like if if I wanted to go and test out some dog toys, well, first of all, we qualitative research at PetMate, it's all about playing with dogs. Mm-hmm. You know, you get to play with dogs. So like we did a lot of like just, you know, in-house like, hey, we'll just play with the dogs that are already around. Mm-hmm. Um, you said dogs around? Oh, yeah. That's awesome. There was plenty of dogs. Um yeah, there was, you know, people got to keep their dogs at their desk and stuff. So, like, we would take prototypes and test them with dogs. Um, in terms of, like, like interviewing people and asking questions, there wasn't a strict guideline or anything. Again, it was very hands-off in terms of, like, hey, Nick, just do your design thing um, and then present the concepts. So, it, it was kind of up to me. Um, and, yeah, I, I don't know if I did a ton of research at PetMate. It wasn't very research-heavy in in that area we did i mean there was definitely some i mean i remember working on i did this slow feeding bowl that had this like wheel on it and it spun and then it dispensed food mm-hmm. the dog can like spin the wheel and it dispense food into a bowl so that the dog wouldn't choke when they're eating too fast and for that one we did a, a quite a bit of research trying to figure out like what what's the biggest opening size for the food to come out um, you know, how do dogs spin it? Do they use their nose? Do they use their mm-hmm. paw? How fast they spin it? You know, does the food fly out? How does the food, you know, there's a lot of research around that project and we did a lot of videos. So like you said, like we took videos, um, so that we could go back and analyze it in that fashion. So tell me if you think this is correct. I feel like a lot of times, cause when I worked at smart, we worked very closely with OXO. So smart would do their own qualitative research, but then OXO would do the research, and a lot of times it was things like that, like researching specific parts, right. how to get it to work. Yeah. So do you think it is too much of a blanket statement to say a lot of times when in-house places do design research or qualitative research, they're researching specific 
things to fix. Whereas when consulting firms are doing qualitative research, it's more of like, what should we be fixing? I can see that. I can definitely, I can, I can definitely see that as a, a blanket statement for sure. But like, I think there is some like general, general truth around that. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, obviously it varies from place to place, but I, I can definitely, I definitely kind of feel that way as well. Reed. Um, but yeah, thanks for sending that in, John. Good question. Um, yeah, feel free to send in a voicemail. We only get like one a week. So if you want to be on the, the podcast, yeah, then now's your chance. That was my first question from Argentina too. It's pretty good. Was it from Argentina? Was John the Glow from Argentina? I what? thought so. It was right there, isn't it? No, this is oh, a, different, this guys, a different person. I just discovered what technology is. So the next question is going to be from Argentina. <laughs> he did say John the Globe. So I kind of assumed it was somewhere else on the globe. <laughs> Uh, John of the Globe works for Quip, but that's another, uh, that's a side note. Uh-huh. Um, all right. We have another question that came from the email and the email is minor details podcast at gmail.com. If you want to send in an email and this one comes from Ignacio and their Instagram handle is at Ignacio Rivorito. Yes. And they say, first of all, I really enjoy the podcast all the way down from Argentina. That's here's, what, that's what I was talking Argentina. about. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Um, Keep it up. I had a question, though. Is there a place for multi- multidisciplinary designers in the modern world? This came up because I was studying history of design and noticed a trend where many designers back in the 20th century not only designed physical products, but also did branding, graphic design, and other stuff. Um, nowadays, I see designers stay in their lane and hone in on their specific skill. But the idea that an all-around designer designer really inspires me what's your take can i answer this yes i think i have a pretty good understanding of it so i think what this person is actually referencing is maybe what's a never leave well enough alone by raymond lowey and that if you're talking about the earliest 20th century that's when design was not actually a discipline at that point it was called arts and crafts so there weren't really designers so i think for you to even have a seat at the table to make money you had to say you were a jack of all trades to do these types of things Whereas now we've spent the last hundred plus years or so trying to basically prove our worth. So now we've been able to basically diversify because we have a seat at the table. That's interesting. I would agree with that. I definitely think this is like, because, because Raymond Lowy did design everything. He designed trains, cars, what logos, all, all kinds of stuff. But he started as, I'm pretty sure it was like window dressing and theater type things is where he started okay that's interesting yeah if if you guys haven't read it it's a good quick book and he's got great anecdotes in it i have read the book oh no i i have the book i've read the first like couple pages i still have to finish it's also the only square it's like a cd if it was 10 like 15 cds deep it's like a square it's this really cool book yeah no i I got it it's cool um yeah i think that's a good question of multiple disciplinary designers like are are they relevant and i think it's kind of interesting to think about this in terms of the consultancy versus in-house framework. I feel like in-house, at least on my side, it was kind of, hey, you got to be able to kind of do a lot of things because, well, maybe this maybe this is just my spe- specific situation of me being like the only person there that was designing the, the toys at the time. It was like I did have to do like the research, the, the sketching, the concepting, the the you know pretty heavily into the manufacturing part of the job um but you said at some of your jobs you had design researchers which is really nice i think yeah it's definitely from my experience an endangered species at design firms oh that's interesting yeah where smart still has them as far as i know but when i was at frog they laid off most of them while i was there so but the weird thing is the old CEO at Frog said, we don't need design researchers because everyone should be a design researcher. But I saw that as bullshit of like, that's like saying we don't need graphic designers because everyone should be a graphic designer. It's like, <laughs> no, you can't. Like people have skills and you should give them value for that. That CEO no longer works at Frog. Okay. Um, but it was, yeah, it's kind of this thing where I think the problem is people don't want to pay for certain things sometimes they expect other people to have it and design research is kind of one of those oh, things i see um and because of that everyone else has to have enough in interest and ability to kind of make it happen um but to the actual question itself like the multidisciplinary designer i feel like it's a trend no longer a trend now because i feel like everyone wants to say they are seven things at once right 
and it just dilutes you yeah. as a brand or as a person or whatever. And people want to hire you for your T level, like your base, your T level skill. And especially when you're coming out of school, if you say, oh, I'm an industrial video engineer product designer, <laughs> I'm like, what the fuck do you actually do then? Like, I don't need you to do all this stuff. I have senior people who can do all this stuff. I, I will say that I, I agree with you. And I also think that if you can even, this this is kind of even a, a, a tangent on this, but, you know, being a much more focused designer and having a single discipline that you really hone in on and become it, it, like if you want to become the best renderer out there and really hone in on your rendering and visualization skills you can arguably get paid more money than just a general industrial designer mm-hmm. i think about some of the renderers out there that i know like they're you know they're working for these awesome companies and like probably like doing way better off than than just a general industrial designer that works at a consultancy or a in-house studio or you know same goes for like if you want to be a model maker like there are model makers that can make amazing things Mm -hmm. and you know they can whip them out really quickly and arguably like they are way better off and and that's in terms of money so like if that's part of the factor that's that's what you want but you know there's many factors that roll into that but i think the thing before I said something that made, probably made some people's skin cr- crawl a little bit of like, you can't be all these things mushed into one. I think you still can be. It's just not calling yourself them all with equal weight. Right. It's, where, it's like the T. It's yeah. like we were talking about. It's like, I'm an industrial designer who has a really good ability to build Legos and make historically <laughs> accurate costumes. Like, I would never say that in the real world because that's not, I'm just joking to prove a point. But like, right. I wouldn't put, I'm a, I'm a Lego costume industrial designer. Like, that just makes it seem like I'm equally as good as all of those things. Right, right, right. And I think that's where the whole multidisciplinary thing comes from. It's like you need to have your base. You need to add things on top of it to make you well-rounded. But you don't have to really call them out as equal. I don't know. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. No, I mean, it's like the classic T-shape. And, and for those who aren't familiar with the T-shape, it's like, you know, the, the letter, the capital letter T. You have the top bar, which would be all of your diverse diversified skills of like oh hey i can do graphic design a little bit i can do like video production a little bit i can do all this stuff a little bit and then you have the long stem that's like hey but i can do all these things a little bit but this is my core Mm -hmm. this is me this is industrial design or whatever it is i think of it as a teeter-totter more where the vertical is your base and everything else has to balance on top of it oh that's interesting a teeter-totter is interesting. Because, like, about you just want to have a nice balance of other things that complement your base. That's true. Um, thanks for sending that in, Ignacio. Um, that was a good question. If you guys have a question, feel free to send it in to myerdetailspodcast at gmail.com. And, of course, every week we like, we like to give a shout-out of the week. And this week I let, I let Reed pick the shout-out. Um, and this is one of Reed's uh, colleagues. Yeah, so. This is. Yeah, this is. Guillaume underscore Deschamps. Guillaume, I know you made fun of me for not having great French last time, so I hope I said it properly. Um, But he's one of those people that I worked with on a project and we kind of clicked as design soulmates. And this was back three years ago in Munich. And he's French, I'm American. We worked in Germany and we had a great time and he's a badass designer, so go check him out. How long were you working in Germany? I think it was two and a half months. That's kind of fun. Yeah, Frog had a Munich studio, so they sent me out there, and we had a great time. And now he works at, I think he works at Above in Stockholm. Wow, okay. So he's got some great work. Yeah, I'm looking at some of his sketches right now. Really, really crispy sketches, nice style to their sketches. Um, and also ooh. an insanely fast concept developer. There's a fun little dog dog leash right there. Dog there you product. go. <laughs> um, but yeah, check him out. It, the, so the Instagram handle is at... Is that a G? Yeah, it's G-U-I-L-L-A-U-M-E underscore D-E-S-C-A-M-P-S. And we'll link to it on the website and on, on our Instagram and stuff, so you can check that out there as well. Um, but yeah, uh, you know, thanks for thanks for filling in, Reed. Um, what are you talking about? I've been James the whole time. What? Yeah. Wait. Hey! It's, hey, it's, what are you talking we just had the Reed voice changer effect onto the... I just background. went to my inner New Jersey. I didn't even pull out James. I don't know what accent that was. But yeah, it was great. Thank you for having me. Um, and as always, please like, subscribe, rate uh, iTunes, YouTube. Give the thumbs up on YouTube. It helps our videos out a lot. And also, I, I've been wanting to like push the five-star review on Apple Podcasts recently because 
We are number 37 on the design category for podcasts. Nice. We are on the charts. What's number one? I never thought we'd even be on the charts. I think number one is like, uh, I want to say 99% visible, but it might be number two. That's a hard one to beat. We're definitely not going to be number one. I can guarantee that. Unless we became full-time podcasters. but Get him to top 10. I, I'm going to be a full-time designer. So maybe one day, maybe James will take over the podcast. James, James, James might be a full-time podcaster one day. I don't know. It's possible. Maybe we'll both retire and become podcasters. Just bring me on once a year. That's all I ask. <laughs> um, again, yeah, thanks for, thanks for tuning in, Reed, uh, or being, You're welcome. being a co-host. <laughs> thanks for listening to your own podcast. It was um, great. And, of course, you, people can find you where? Um, I live in Brooklyn. I don't care. You can if you find me on Instagram, cool. If not, don't follow me. It's okay. Um, uh, as always, I'm at Nick B. Baker, and I'm at Reed Dotschlegel. Peace out, guys. Bye. Instinct that had one and made us start going boop, 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 boop. <laughs>